Judge Angeron, a.k.a. the bonus torso, he is now prohibiting Donald Trump from even participating in his closing arguments. If you thought that this courtroom wasn't a big enough circus, well, now Donald Trump has made a request, notified the court that he's going to be participating in closing arguments, but Angeron said no. You're not allowed to testify unless you comply with what I want you to say, unless Trump does exactly what Angeron says and says this and says this and says this before he speaks, he's not going to be allowed to speak. Now, we're going to go through this because closing arguments are just around the corner and Trump is responding to this. It's like a preemptive gag. He's gagged from even closing his arguments, providing closing arguments. And it's just more par for the course nonsense out of this. And we're going to have closing arguments and then Judge Angeron is going to issue a ruling and no doubt it's going to be adverse to Trump. The question is, can these procedural problems, can these rubs be appealable? You know, can Trump appeal this issue as the next level court in the Court of Appeals? They're going to do anything as a result of it? Who knows? But this is what it looks like. This is what the circus freak show is like in New York City. City. So here is the judge. Now, this is an email chain. It's 10 pages long. And we're going to start by going back to January 3rd. Happy New Year. Who sent this email? Trump closing arguments are right around the corner. They're scheduled on the 11th. And so the email comes from you know who? Allison Greenfield. Okay, the judge's chief principal law clerk. The same woman that Angeron has, you know, some sort of weird thing with. I don't know what's going on there. But in my opinion, these two have a much closer relationship than normal judges judges and principal law clerks, okay, whatever that means. She is sitting on the bench, literally next to him on the same level. They're looking at the same screen. When Trump's defense team was asking about her, judge gagged them, said, don't you dare talk about my Greenfield. She was passing little, you know, court love notes, say, do this, do that, whatever. We don't know what's in the notes. When they were wanting to get recordings of this, they moved the cameras, okay, so that you couldn't see what these two were doing. I don't know what they were doing. Some people speculate, maybe they were playing footsie there under the bench. I don't know. But it seems suspicious when they don't want you to see what they're doing, what they're talking about. The question is, who is actually the judge on the case? And so she's the one who is authoring a lot of these emails. And people have been saying, maybe she's the one who's been actually governing the trial because Angeron's not that bright. And so let's take a look at who is ultimately starting off this email chain. You see, it says here from Allison Greenfield, the judge's GF, and he sent this to everybody, okay? Tishy's office, Alina Abba's on here, and a bunch of lawyers, okay? Everybody on the case says, okay, closing on arguments, everybody, are scheduled on January 11th. You see Allison Greenfield, the principal law clerk to Judge Angeron, says, Dear counselors, I write to advise you that we will be back in courtroom on January 11th for closing arguments. Now, however, as the NRA trial will have already started, the courtroom is going to be set up a little bit differently than it was for trial testimony. Now, I've copied Rob on here, not me. I wish. I have a nice response for them. But I've copied Rob on here so that you may clear any tech questions with him. I would say, can you turn the cameras back on so we can see your little footsie games, please. Now, additionally, Judge Angeron would also like to know how many people and who will be speaking for each side. And obviously, Donald Trump's like, oh yeah, I got something to say to you guys. And how much time each person wants. And please keep in mind, we only have one day. Thank you. Allison Greenfield, the judge's GF. Now, this goes out and the government responds. KCW responds. They say, Miss Greenfield, at this time, we anticipate the closing argument for Tishy's office will take an hour and will be conducted by one person from the team. It's going to be either me or Mr. Amir. Now that estimate could change depending on the arguments from Trump's team in their proposed findings of fact and their conclusions of law and in their closings. Now this is also based on an assumption the closing arguments will follow standard practice with the defense going first and the plaintiff presenting second. Now if any of those assumptions are incorrect or if more time is required, we might divide up the argument. 20 minutes here, 20 minutes after for rebuttals, you know, whatever. Now we will let the court know if we think that becomes necessary. We also anticipate other members of our trial team could address specific questions from the court if they involve areas areas of their expertise. Regards, KCW. Okay, pretty benign. Nothing really interesting there. Uh, Greenfield says, okay, thank you for your response. You know, the court is currently operating under the assumption that we're going to follow the normal practice. Defense goes first, plaintiffs go last, and plaintiffs go last, you know, because they've got the burden. Ugh. Well, we will, however, wait to hear back from the defense. Signed, Allison Greenfield, the judge's GF. Okay, so the defense is thinking, okay, here we go. Christopher Keese responds. Now, he doesn't have time for capitalization, okay? He's a serious defense attorney. He says, look, Miss Greenfield. Happy New Year! Exclamation point. At this time, the defense anticipates the closing arguments are going to take about two hours, maybe two hours, 15 minutes total. Chris says, I will present more extensive argument, and then Miss Abba and Mr. Robert will also present more limited arguments. Now, additionally, President Trump plans to present arguments at closing as well. You see that one? Just slide that in there. You know, President Trump is going to just, he's going to say something, but we anticipate that all such arguments will be completed within the above time estimate. Just so you know, now as a practical matter, this means the defense will be done before 
lunch break, leaving ample time for the attorney general the remainder of the day so they can have all the time in the world. Please advise if you have further questions. Thank you. Very simple, okay? They want one hour. Trump's people want two hours, 15 minutes. Very quick. Keese is in there. Abba's in there. Robert's in there. And Trump wants to come, you know, close it out. No problem. Happy New Year, Miss Greenfield. Here's the response. Oh, gosh. Andrew Ammer, special counsel. Yeah, right. From the office of the attorney general from Tishy's office says, uh-oh. And this fires right back. So this goes out. January 4th from Chris, lunchtime, 12.47 p.m. They respond, 5.13. Okay, same day. So about four hours later. They say, all right, Judge Angeron. And they're responding to him and to Greenfield. They say, all right, everybody. Letitia Tish, she opposes Trump's plan to have Mr. Trump present any portion of their closing argument. Government objects. Trump can't speak. They say Mr. Trump is not permitted to do so as a matter of right. He doesn't have the right to do this. Saying under these laws, under these rules, that if a party of appears by attorney, such party may not act in person in the action except by consent of the court. CPLR, you know, some commercial practices, whatever it is, right? They're in like this weird subset of New York law. You know, if you're in this commercial litigation, if you're not act except with consent of the court. Okay. So Judge Angeron, you need to give him permission. Even in criminal proceedings where the Sixth Amendment and the state constitution afford the right of a right to counsel or self-representation, they do not guarantee a right to both. Either it's a right to counsel or right to self-representation. And these are separate rights. And so there is no right to hybrid representation. So by accepting counsel, they say, Trump assigns control to the lawyer who by reason of training. And so accordingly, a defendant who chooses to defend himself doesn't get permission by matter of right to present closing arguments. But nevertheless, the court has the power and the exercise of its discretion to grant a specific application for limited participation of a defendant as counsel, but only when doing so is not going to disrupt the orderly administration of justice. And allowing Trump, they say, to present even a portion of Trump's closing argument would do both. The court has already found that Mr. Trump is prone to giving irrelevant speeches. He lacks self-control, they say. He's evasive in responding to the questions and has repeatedly violated court orders for which he's already been sanctioned. Remember that. And by the way, they also gagged the lawyers, okay? Trump can't talk about the judge's GF, his Greenfield, and also the lawyers can't talk about it, which is insane because they have to make a record representing their client, especially when they're passing love notes in court. So allowing Mr. Trump, they say, to present closing argument will involve invite more violated court orders and will invite more speech that will disrupt us. And moreover, Trump had the right to present testimony on his case when he was on the stand, but elected last minute to do so during their presentation in case he didn't, he choose not to take the stand. But they say, so allowing Trump to participate now in closing arguments would grant him the opportunity to testify without being subject to cross-examination, thereby depriving the people of a fundamental right of prejudice, especially in light of the court's prior determination that Trump is not a credible witness. And so they say, Mr. Keese's email should be treated as an application to allow Mr. Trump to present closing argument. And as we detailed, it should be denied. So Trump should not even be allowed to speak. Andrew says it's going to be disruptive to our proceedings. And so Judge Angeron says, oh, perfect. I hate Trump. Let me respond to this. Says, dear counselors, Angeron, he fires this back at 1 a.m. p.m. the next day. He's up all night thinking about it. He says, you know, in the email to which this email responds, Mr. Keese announced, this is kind of like an order, that Trump plans to present an argument at closing. Anger on the areola says if a party appears by attorney, then they must grant consent. And they say, well, obviously Trump appears by attorney. And so thus, and as far as my research has revealed, like whatever judge, whether he may present a closing argument is completely at my discretion. So anger on now has the discretion to let him speak. He says, particularly in a non-jury trial, like a circus freak show like this is, I am inclined to let everyone have his or her say. No, you're not because you've repeatedly gagged everyone. Now, moreover, the more reasoned analysis I receive, the better I will be able to decide this case correctly. And furthermore, Mr. Trump is the person by far with the most at stake in this enforcement action. So Angeron says, and he's writing this email, 1.15 p.m., whether a shirt is on, I don't know. Thus, in my sole discretion, I will consent, listen to this, to let Mr. Trump make a closing argument if, and only if, through counsel by 1-9-2024 and by himself personally and on the record just before he speaks. In other words, Donald Trump Trump, before he gets up there to participate in his closing argument, Trump has to say these words. He agrees verbally, Trump on the record, Trump agrees. He says, yes, your honor. I agree to limit my subjects to what is permissible in a counsel's closing argument, which is commentary on relevant material facts that are in evidence and application of the relevant law to those facts. And Trump says, I know I may not introduce new evidence and I know I may not testify. I know I may not comment on irrelevant matters and in particular and without limitation I may not deliver a candidate.
campaign speech. And I may not impugn the court, the staff, the plaintiff, the plaintiff staff, which is Tishy, or New York court system, none of which is relevant to this case, and all of which, except commenting on my staff can be done, is being done in other forums, right? He says, Trump and through his counsel, so the lawyer and Donald Trump, they have to say all of that garbage before he even speaks, is how I'm reading this. And himself, personally, on the record, just before he speaks, he must agree to that. Now, I don't know if the judge is going to want him to like, do you agree to this? Do you agree to this? Or if he's just going to say, Trump, are you familiar with the, with the document your attorney signed, which includes all of that? I don't know. But that's a lot, right? He can't say anything. And by the way, the whole system is, you know, garbage and rigged. And so that's why that would be a part of your closing argument. This is all sham. It's all a political prosecution. It's not even legitimate. And so judge, if you find against me, you know, obviously you're enabling an illegitimate prosecution. That's a weaponized attack against political enemy. He can't say any of that, right? So look at all these conditions. Can't testify. Can't comment on irrelevant matters. Can't deliver a campaign speech. Can't comment on my staff, blah, blah, blah. If Mr. Trump violates any of these rules, I will not hesitate to cut him off in mid-sentence and admonish him. And if he continues to violate the rules, I will end his closing argument and prevent him from making any further statements in the courtroom. If he violates the gag order against him and the current one, which is talking about his GF's love notes, I will immediately direct court officers to remove him from the courtroom and I will fine him not less than $50,000. Woo! Finally, he must state on the record before he begins to speak that he also understands that, in addition to all that other garbage, without exception, that the defense collectively have only from 10.15 to 12.45 with one 15-minute break, meaning that whatever time he speaks is time that other defense attorneys will not have. And says that Tishy is also going to get two hours and 15 minutes from 2.15 to 4.30 p.m. to present their closing arguments. And so if Mr. Keese, if your client is willing to agree to all of that and to just read my little commie manifesto on the record in my courtroom, then he can say whatever he wants, which is basically nothing. It's like a joke. Okay. So Mr. Keese says, Angeron, please respond. So Keese is like, the heck is going on here? So he responds. He says, your honor, Angeron, thank you for your response and the proposal below. He says, first, I agree that in a non-jury trial, and especially this trial, your inclination to let everyone have his or her say really is the best approach. Also agree that the more reasoned analysis you receive, the better you're going to be able to decide the case correctly. And additionally, says Trump's lawyer, and as you know, Trump has by far the most at stake in this enforcement action. Therefore, allowing him to make a statement is not only the best course of action, it's the fair and the correct approach. However, Ariola, Trump cannot agree, nor would I recommend he do so to the proposed preconditions and what is that word? Prior restraints on his free speech. Christopher says, okay, judge. Now, as an initial matter, under the present circumstances where the AG seeks the unconscionable and the draconian penalty of prohibiting Trump, Trump, who has contributed both professionally and personally to the economic development, job growth, real estate footprint for 50 years, from ever again engaging in any lawful business, even though the evidence in trial established he did nothing wrong, it's crazy. Given the same, he most assuredly should be accorded the opportunity to address the court. And further, the preconditions and the prior restraints that you proposed on us are fraught with ambiguities, and they create a substantial likelihood for misinterpretation or unintended violations. For example, the notion that he could not comment on the AG that you put in there, like the plaintiff, is simply untenable. What? As a prosecutor. Moreover, given the history of these proceedings, agreement that such ambiguous limitations will no doubt simply create further disagreements. And so he says, therefore, while as noted, now I agree with your stated conclusions, like I agree totally with you, judge, that the fair and best approach is to allow him to make a statement, as you admitted, he cannot agree to the proposed limitations and the prior restraints. The existing gag order, although on appeal, it remains, but there's should otherwise not be any prior restraints on any statement he provides at closing. Judge, please advise as to whether you will permit Trump to speak at closing without the proposed limitations. Thank you, Judge. Respectfully, Chris. In other words, not going to work for me there, Angie. He continues. Now, Angeron responds. Uh-oh, we got a nice response here. So, Christopher Key sent his January 9th, 11, 10 a.m. Angeron's furious. He's like sitting there over his lunch. Allison's sitting there probably too. And he responds. Christopher Key's copying everybody else. He says, okay, dear Mr. Keese, you and your client's rejection of the reasonable and normal limits, that's normal, I am imposing on any argument by Trump, which are the same limit that the law imposes on anyone making a closing argument. Really, they have to like hop on a balance beam or else they get penalized by $50,000 fines. Is it really the same? It completely justifies the need to impose them. Oh my gosh. So the fact that you're rejecting what I just gave to you shows why we need them because you guys are just ornery and stubborn and combative. 
Closing arguments are for an advocate to comment on the evidence presented, on the relevant law, and on how the latter applies to the former to justify their result. Now, such arguments may not be used to testify, to make campaign speeches, to introduce new evidence, and other things. And I got a bunch of case law to support that. Now, anyone can comment on the arguments of the opposing party or counsel, but may not seek to impugn their character. Again, he's like creating all these new standards. What does that mean? Now, of course, I will apply common sense, right? There it is. Like, he's not referencing, I will apply my common sense if there's any issue or doubt. <laughs> we don't trust your common sense. You're already covering up your footsie game with Greenfield. But I will not let anyone, he underlines, violate the normal rules of courtroom procedure that govern closing arguments. And so the limitations I am imposing in my absolute discretion are not subject to further debate. Angeron tells Christopher Keese, take it or leave it, buddy. And please let me know which by 4 p.m. today. 4 p.m. today on January 9th. Now he says, Mr. Keese, not having heard from you or any other defense attorneys by the 4 p.m. deadline pursuant to the law and to the reason stated below, Mr. Trump may not speak in court during this Thursday's closing arguments. Now, in order to preserve the record for appellate review, I'm going to docket this email chain, and they did, which is where I got it. Signed by Judge Angeron. So Trump is banned. Now, Angeron, Christopher Key says, Judge, I apologize. I didn't see your deadline. Additionally, my client is in the air, so I have not yet been able to discuss your email with him. Would therefore request you allow until tomorrow morning for any response. Okay, so here, let's go back. He sent this. So it was 4 p.m. today, right? 4 p.m. today. He sent the email at 123. Punk? Gosh, what a punk. Like the dude is in a meeting. He gets out. He's like, what? 4 p.m. today? Can't respond to that. So he gives him like two hours, two and a half hours. And he said, I didn't see your deadline. Trump is in the air. We got other stuff going on, jerk. So can you please extend it? So Angeron says here. So Christopher says that. Can you please give it until tomorrow morning? Let me look at it for crying out loud. So then we pause and pay our respects to Melania's mother because unfortunately she passed away. May she rest in peace and prayers to the Trump and Melania families. Saying here on January 9th, Christopher Key sends an email to the judge saying, Judge Angeron, I am sad to advise the court that Mrs. Trump's mother passed away this evening. And because of the challenges presented by this deeply personal family member, President Trump has asked and I request that the court postpone the date for closing arguments until on or after January 29th so that he may attend and participate in the court proceedings. He's got a mother-in-law, the mother of his wife passed away. Kind of an important one. You gotta, gotta be there for that. Respectfully, Christopher Keese. What does the judge say? Dear Mr. Keese, next morning, 848, he responds, sorry to hear the sad news. <laughs> the request to postpone tomorrow's closing arguments is denied. Now, I'm sure you realize, although you may not realize to what extent, that every appearance of Mr. Trump requires court officers, court clerks, administrators, security details, and technical people to rearrange their schedules to plan for the day. The administration even had to, quote, evict the jury trial currently taking place in room 300. Now, of course, I am also anxious to hear a full day of closing statements as I consider the case as a whole. So he's like, I really want to do this, okay? I'm anxious. I really need you guys in here. Sorry, your mother-in-law is now dead. I don't care. I really want to get this done. See you tomorrow. On balance, going forward makes the most sense. Please tell Mr. Trump that I'm sorry. I still hope and expect to hear from you by 11 a.m. this morning as to whether all this is even an issue. Is Trump going to come? Is he going to testify? What's your position, Judge Angeron? So they carry on. He says, Judge Angeron, despite the fact that his mother-in-law, Melania's mom, rest in peace, who he was very close to, despite the fact that she passed away late last night, this was on January 10th, today, she died last night, President Trump will be speaking tomorrow. He's going to show up into your disgusting courtroom and be here, and he's going to deliver his closing arguments. So the judge says, Dear Mr. Case, as I have already indicated to you, if Mr. Trump wishes to speak pursuant to the law, you will have to tell me now, now, that Trump will agree to the limitations that I have opposed, which go without saying and apply to everyone, and he will have to agree to do so tomorrow on the record, which should take no more than a minute or two. Like the judge is going to hit him with a list. You can't do this. You understand? You have to tell me right now, is he agreeing or not? And he sent that at 1057 AM on today. Tell me right now. <laughs> Allison sitting right next to him is like, you have to be more firm, judge. Like be firm. Like you're tough. He's like, yeah, let me put in capitalize it. So Christopher Key says, your honor, Justice Angeron, this is very unfair, your honor. You are not allowing President Trump, 
who has been wrongfully demeaned and belittled by an out-of-control, politically motivated attorney general to speak about the things that must be spoken about, period. Not even a goodbye or anything. This is very unfair. He sends that back at 1140. That deadline is now passed, hasn't it? Christopher, the judge responds, he says, Dear Mr. Case, I won't debate this yet again. Take it or leave it. Now or never. You have until noon, seven minutes from now, to respond. I will not grant any further extensions. Caps lock. Judge this anger on. Right now, until noon. Now, Mr. Keese didn't respond. Pfft, get out of here. So Angeron responds back and he says, Dear Mr. Keese, not having heard from you by the third extended deadline, which was noon today, I assume that Mr. Trump will not agree to the reasonable lawful limits that I have imposed as a precondition to giving a closing statement above and beyond those given by his attorneys and that therefore Trump will not be speaking in court tomorrow. Now, if I previously indicated this email chain is going to be docketed and you can appeal it. Judge Angeron. And that's the end of the chain, my friend. So Judge Angeron in his discretion says no to Trump, copying everyone on there. Trump will not be speaking according to the judge. We'll see what happens tomorrow. I'm sure that Christopher Keese is going to throw a very big fit about that as he should. Now, let me just show you briefly what is inside the civil fraud closing brief by Donald Trump, because there will be closing arguments tomorrow. I'm hopeful there is a nice X thread courtesy of somebody who is there, but this is what they'll be arguing. Now, this is a very financial case, so this is not an interesting closing brief, but let me just show you what's inside. So it says here, closing brief, proposed conclusions of law by Trump and everyone else, the Trump organization and so on. You see the table of contents, which we normally fast forward through, but I'll just show you what's inside because it's quite technical. They say the New York claims are time barred, right? The statute of limitations really doesn't, it bars a bunch of stuff. The clear and convincing evidence standard applies. The AG is not met her burden on materiality, not met her burden on intent. There's no establishment of a conspiracy. The remedies she seeks are insane. The attorney general has gotten no evidence of ill-gotten gains and so on. Here, the New York claims, here are some conclusions. So it's not actually even written like a nice closing argument. It's just kind of conclusions of law. They say here, claims are dismissed on the extent that they're time barred, right? All of these say that the AG's novel theory, the reason they kept, you know, going all the way back was because they said every time there was a new false financial statement, it reset the statute of limitations. And they say that's ridiculous. The AG's claims are therefore only timely with regard to two items, the OPO loan and the 40 Wall Street loans. Everything else is not permissible. And the judge says, well, I don't really care about the statute of limitations because what I want to do is consider the totality of the circumstances, right? In order to make my decision. And I need to know everything from no matter how far it goes back. They say here also, they want Tishy. She's asking that Trump be prohibited from engaging in any businesses, right? Like he cannot be permitted to do business in New York. That's not responsive to a loss of money, right? If Trump, you know, made money by ill-gotten gains, it's a money problem. She wants to prohibit him from doing any business at all because she's saying the fraudulency is so, you know, broad and so pervasive. So there's a lot of case law being cited here. They say there was unequivocal and unrebutted evidence contained in credit memos that establishes that DB conducted its own independent analysis and relied on that analysis and not Trump's. There were no mispayments. The testimony of Flemons and others say that these statements are intended for users and not for preparers. And also the very first note to the SFCs, which was prepared by Trump or the trust, not Mazars, provides in part, it says, considerable judgment is necessary to interpret these things. And so, you know, there were disclaimer clauses like, hello, do your own due diligence before you rely on anything in these statements. They say Tishy Latish James has not met her burden on materiality that were these financial statement problems that she alleges, were they actual material? There's no testimony that the banks would have done anything differently. The onus is on the lender, the person who sends the money out to determine what's material. No bank or underwriter says that they were materially misled by any of this. And so Tishy hasn't met the standard. Evidence shows that DB gave significant weight to Trump and his experience in real estate. He had private clubs and a lot of other assets. And so DB did their own due diligence. They decided to do business. There's no evidence in the record to say that DB would have foregone these transactions with Trump and saying that Tishy has failed to establish that any person claimed to have been misled by the financial statements. Everybody came in and testified to support this. And there's no evidence to say the city, even New York, would have foregone its transaction with Trump. Everybody wanted to do business. There's no evidence that Zurich would have foregone their relationship as well. Saying that Tishy also has failed to show that there was any actual intent to defraud. Evidence shows that they relied, the banks, on their own independent valuations. And she cannot rely on this summary judgment to make this claim. There's no evidence that 
anybody had the requisite intent to defraud anybody meeting the standards that are required under the law. Trump did not have fraudulent intent. There's no clear evidence to the contrary. Weisselberg didn't. No one did. They were all trying to comply with the generally accepted accounting principles. And so appraisals very significantly, it's up to the banks. And so Tishy has failed to establish clear and convincing evidence that there was any actual fraud here. Established that there was no conspiracy. Testimony from this guy, Patrick Bernie's inadmissible. Multiple layers of hearsay to keep certain evidence out. And the remedies that Tishy wants are inappropriate. Trying to disgorge him of everything and to disqualify him from doing business in New York. Case law reinforces our position and the AG is requesting disgorgement and it's really amounting to punitive penalties. And so as you can see, right, a lot of this is quite technical from the US Supreme Court saying these sanctions mandate that Trump forfeits his businesses. These are improper. They are punishment against Trump and they cannot be reviewed as solely remedial. It's not balancing the scales. It is creating a massive penalty. This is not criminal law. The sanctions are explicitly intended to deter Trump's future conduct, not to compensate New York for the fraud. And they're grossly disproportionate to the purported offenses. Even if Tishy had proven Trump's conduct, which he didn't, there was no harm to the public at all. The transactions at issue were complex. They were bilateral business deals between Trump and the banks, none of which involved an impact on the public or the public market in any way. It's undisputed that the lenders profited from the transactions. They made money. No entity has identified any wrong or lodged complaint with the New York Attorney General at all. All loans were repaid in full. There were no defaults, nor did any witness from a single institution testify that they would have done anything different if they knew what it knows now. Beautiful paragraph there, right? The whole thing is just a giant political attack saying that all of these assessments and a disgorgement penalty in the amount of hundreds of millions of dollars is far beyond what you get in any other cases. Here, you remember Martin Shkreli. He got, he was the big pharma bro. They awarded 64 million in disgorgement against him, a quarter of what was sought for the New York AG. There was all sorts of pharmaceutical allegations there. They're also seeking to bar Trump from any commercial transactions in New York, and it is a giant penalty. So there's no evidence here to support these claims, no evidence of ill-gotten gains, and so Tishy is wrong on everything. And as you can see, we'll come to the conclusion. Finally, to the extent the court intends to issue a decision adverse to Trump, which of course Angeron will, we ask that it be stayed while we appeal to the higher level courts. Submitted by Abba Madayo and Associates out of New York, signed by Michael, looks like himself. So Trump's team, along with Christopher Keese, submitting their closing brief in Tishy Letitia's civil prosecution of Donald Trump. And so Trump, we know, according to Angeron, not going to be speaking there tomorrow. So Trump came out and started speaking today. Here is what he said over on True Social. He posted this video response. One of the most outrageous, illegal, and corrupt acts among many by the corrupt Soros-backed New York State Attorney General Tish, Tish James, controlled judge, and Gorin. He's controlled by Areola. Tish James, which is a horrible thing because she's bad news and everybody knows it. But it's his refusal to honor the appellate division's ruling that this witch hunt should be dismissed on statute of limitation grounds, among others. Not only did I do nothing wrong, great financial statements, it all came due and all came up during the trial. My statements are great, much better than anyone had any idea. Much, much, they're great. The expert witness said among the greatest financial statements he's ever seen. So the statements were great. There were no damages to anybody. There were no victims. The banks were happy. Think of it, I had a bank. They wanted to make a loan, they made a loan. I paid back the loan in full. No negotiations, no anything, no victims. Victims, no damages. The banks were happy, but the whole hoax should have been ended long before this pathetic excuse for a trial ever started. So you borrow money, you pay back the money, and you get sued by Tish. essentially the DOJ Tish. because they'll do anything. They went through millions of pages of documents, my documents, and the they documents. end up going after me over a loan that was repaid in full. No negotiation, no anything that the bank was very happy with. It's a fix. It's a rigged system. And That's Gorin, true. the judge, shockingly refused to follow the express orders of the highly respected appellate division in New York State, where we overwhelmingly won. The case is over. Such disrespect for an appeals court, the job of which is to protect New Yorkers from a runaway judge like Angeron. perhaps Angoran, is unheard of in our country and smacks of banana republics and third world countries. Those tactics employed by crooked Joe Biden's other henchmen and people like deranged Jack Smith, who was Illegitimate. brought in to try and get Trump, but he's not doing so well. No, he's not. The rule of law in New York State will never recover if this partisan attack is not immediately
immediately squashed. Thereafter, his political opponent, because Biden is losing badly to me in the polls, he's doing horribly. Essentially, he's a horrible president, and the people understand that. So they go after me when actually I've done a great job. They try saying I've done a bad job and a dishonest job, and that turned out to be false. And they didn't know what to do in the middle of the trial, but they kept it going. This trial should have never been brought. It should have been ended early. It should have gone to the commercial division, like all other cases. But the judge, who's a Trump hater, refused to let it go. He refused under any circumstances to let it go. He had no victims. The banks testified. They were happy. They didn't even know what they were doing there. They got back all of their money. They got back all of their interest. Frankly, they wanted to make me the loan, because that's what they do. They make loans, and they make money when they make loans. Yes, they do. And this was a great loan for them. And they acknowledged that at the trial. And this is where they went after me. Now they want $370 million plus other things, but $370 million, which is far more than the loans. Far more than the loans. Crazy. They were perfect loans. The banker said, I wish we had all our loans like this. They ought to focus on violent crime in New York because it's driving people out of the state and leave people that pay millions and millions of dollars in taxes alone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donald Trump. Nice closing statement and absolutely correct. It is just all rigged and they want more penalty, more money and penalties than the actual loans were even worth. So Donald Trump delivers his closing argument here on the interwebs. We'll see what happens tomorrow when he's there in court and there are closing arguments in Tishy Letitia's prosecution. We're going to be here to continue to cover it, my friends, and we hope that you join us as we do. So don't forget to subscribe wherever you're watching this. Thanks for checking out robertgovea.com, which is our website. You can sign up for our daily newsletter there so that everything that we talk about, if you miss anything, it gets bundled up, delivered via email right to your inbox. That way you can forward it to all of your friends and family members so they can see what type of garbage is happening here behind the scenes. They can see the documents and see that Angeron is prohibiting Trump from even making a statement because they're so petrified. He might speak some truth about the sham trial that's taking place in his courtroom. We'll see you back here on the next one.